Hi and welcome to Physics High and today I'm going to go through the answers of the short answer section of the 2022 HSC Physics paper. But before we start, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell to get my latest updates. And please consider supporting my work by buying me a coffee. The link is in the description below. So let's get started. In our first short answer question, we have here a situation dealing with module eight. And in this case, what we have is an HR diagram, which is a graph that represents the magnitude or brightness of a star with its temperature or spectral class. And in this case, we're given two stars, X and Y. One of them here is on the main sequence. And then there's the other one over here, which is in what we would call our giant section. And the first question says, to compare qualitatively two things. The first is their surface temperature and the second is their luminosity. So as you can see, what we have here is our absolute magnitude. And our absolute magnitude here is basically stars that are very, very bright. Whereas over down the bottom here are stars that are very, very dim. So in other words, this gives us an indication of its luminosity. When we look on the x-axis, we have the temperature. So these stars over here are very hot, and these stars, relatively speaking, are cooler. And I'll say cooler because it still could be like two, 3,000 Kelvin as a surface temperature. And so now we're in the position to answer the question. So now let's have a look at the surface temperature. You can see that Y is further along this way. So straight away, you can tell that Y here has a lower temperature than X, where here the temperature is definitely higher. In terms of the brightness or luminosity, because Y is sitting higher, it's brighter. So its luminosity is going to be greater, whereas star X, its luminosity is definitely lower. And that actually gives us more information about the star. This basically means if it's cooler but still brighter, it's also much, much larger. The next question says, what are the elements undergoing fusion in these two stars? In this case, we're looking at a simplistic example in the HSC, this is question 21. So it's basically looking for a fairly simple answer. Now, as I said, we have the main sequence here. These are stars that are undergoing hydrogen fusion. The only thing that's really different is their size and therefore the rate at which that fusion occurs. So the stars that are further up here are much, much hotter, much, much brighter, and are undergoing fusion much more quickly. So they have a shorter lifespan. And down here, we have stars that last billions of years, they get to go hydrogen fusion, but at a much lower rate, and they end up also being smaller. And so in that regard, we can automatically say that star X, it's hydrogen fusion that is going on. Whereas over here, we have our giant stars. This is where most of the hydrogen is depleted in the process of fusion, and it starts to fuse other elements, heavier elements. And the key one that this question will be referring to is that it's helium fusion taking place in the giants. Now, in reality, there are other elements also being fused right up into carbon for the smaller massive stars, so to speak. And then, for example, in our supermassive stars that move over into the supergiant phase, you might get fusion right up to iron. But in essence, these are the two key differences at this level. On to question number 22, and here we're dealing with a transformer, which is found in module six, where we're dealing specifically in the third inquiry question all about electromagnetic induction. So in this question, we're asked to identify two features in this diagram that lead to an increased in efficiency. So let's examine the diagram. First thing is, is that what we have here is a copper wire. The second thing we want to look at is the idea of this continuous iron core. And the third one that's mentioned here is the concept of lamination. Before we discuss how these might affect the efficiency, let's quickly touch on the concept of efficiency. In essence, what we have is a certain amount of power input, and over here we have a certain amount of power that is 
out. In essence, if it's efficient, then the ratio of these are going to be such that you're going to have them at basically at a very, very high ratio. You do not want basically a significant drop in power or power loss. In other words, the power out should be as close as possible to the power in. Now, that basically means it's about energy that has been transformed with respect to time. And so where we're seeing energy losses in the system means a decrease in the efficiency. And so we want to reduce the energy loss. So let's deal first of all with our copper wires. Well, copper wires basically means it has a lower resistance than other types of wires. And so therefore the current is going to be higher and therefore also the wires aren't going to heat up as much because the current resistance is low. So there's our first aspect. The fact that you have copper wires Wires means you have less resistance, less heat transformations in the wire, and therefore it increases the efficiency of the system. The second one is the concept of this continuous iron core. Now what we have here is a rate of change of flux going on, and this secondary coil here is experiencing that rate of change of flux, and that results in electromagnetic induction. And of course that basically means we have a voltage up or a voltage down transformer. And that basically means what we will get is a step up transformer in this case, because we have less coils here, greater coils over here, and as a result the voltage will be bigger on that side. The point here is, is that you want the maximum rate of change of flux in this coil. And the way we do that is by introducing an iron core, which basically increases the, what we call the flux linkage. And therefore, because we have an increase flux linkage, we reduce the power loss, we reduce the energy loss, and therefore increases the efficiency of the system. Finally though, we've got lamination. Why? Well, the fact is, is that this iron core, although it increases the flux linkage, which is a good thing, the fact is it in itself is experiencing a rate of change of flux. And so as a result, eddy currents form within the iron core. Eddy currents are basically circular electrical kinds, and that generates heat, and that means energy loss. So the lamination reduces the production of those eddy kinds, and as a result, we have more energy being transformed from the primary coil to the secondary coil, therefore increasing the efficiency. Now in this four mark question, it asks you to outline a method to determine a value for the speed of light. And in your answer, identify one factor that would re reduce limit the accuracy of the experimental data. Now, there are two methodologies that you can employ. And the first is what we refer to as a time of flight. In other words, if we are able to send out some sort of light in that direction, have it travel, let's say, to a mirror, and then return back over here, we now have a path that is two times the distance between where I send out the light and the distance to the mirror. If I have some way of measuring the time difference between these two pulses of light, I end up having a time that's going to be equal to T. Now, there are two scientists who did this very experiment. The first was Fuzo, who had a series of cogs here that turned that allowed him to work out the time between one path over here. And as a result, he got a very small time. And so he was able to work out with some sort of accuracy the time of flight for the light beam. Now, about a decade or so later, we had Foucault, who similarly worked at the time of flight method, and in this case was the idea of spinning mirrors. And again, the same procedure. Work out the distance. In this case, it's two times the distance. Work out the time that it took there, and then automatically your speed ends up being the two times the distance divided by the time traveled. And so that's how you end up getting some sort of calculation in terms of the time of flight for our light. Now, the question says is, well, what would limit the accuracy of the results? Well, there are two areas. Obviously, you need extremely large distance here. And obviously, you need to measure this distance with great precision. In other words, if your distance is just, say, a roughly five meters, not only is that too short, you need something that has more significant figures. And in essence of Foucault and Fuseau, that distance was in, measured in miles or kilometers. And again, the time here, how do you set up devices so you can consistently measure an extremely short amount of time? Now, if you're limited by that, 
amount of time here, you need to make your distances longer. Mickelson did this in 1929, where his distance was actually a, a tube that was eight kilometers long. He was able to measure time and got a value that was within 0.1% of the speed of light. But you can see that your timing methods and your distance measurements are going to be limiting factors to your determination here. The other method is using the concept of EMR, electromagnetic radiation. And that is, is if you set up a microwave, and in this case, you can use your own home microwave, and the microwave has a frequency or resonant frequency of 2450 megahertz. Now, if you are able, is setting up a standing wave in this particular microwave, and let's say I draw a standing wave that looks something like this, and I remove the plate, then the places where the food gets heated is where we have the maximum vibration going on here. And so if you can measure the hot points over here, you have a measure of half the wavelength. And in the case that you could do at home, and I've done a video on this, is that you put some chocolate in there or some, some food where you will get that chocolate or food to react to the heat. In this case, chocolate would melt. And you can then measure the distance in this case, that would be half of the wavelength between two successive hot points. Now, what's the limiting factor? Well, the limiting factor is how you measure this. Well, you're gonna get a big blob of melted food in the case of cheese or chocolate. And so your precision of here is gonna be limited. But how can you work out the speed here? Well, the speed of course is equal to F multiplied by the wavelength. Here, this gives you the wavelength here. And so by measuring this distance, doubling that gives you the wavelength. The frequency of the microwave is 2450 megahertz. And so you can determine the speed of light. And that is actually the method that Essen used in the 40s, though not with a microwave oven. In our next question, we're dealing again with module eight, but in this case, we're looking at radioactive decay. And what we have here is a radioactive decay of uh, americium-242, and that actually is the radioactive sample that is used in everyday home smoke detectors. Now, what we have here is a decay that is a negative exponential decay. And we're asked, first of all, it says use the graph to determine the half-life of americium-242 and hence show the decay constant is this value. Well, you're going to get it right by comparing the actual answer you calculate with the value over here. Now, the clue here is to know that half-life is the time it takes for half of the sample to decay. You can see we start with 80. And so we need to know the time when half of that's decayed into another form. And you can see what we have here is it's half is 40. And then what we do is simply read across our graph and then go down and we get a time that is over here. And so that is that the half-life is 16 hours we now can work out the decay constant. The decay constant, which is lambda, is equal to the natural log of two divided by that particular half-life. When you do that calculation out, you're gonna get 0 0.043 per hour. And that's consistent with the answer that's given. Now, what about the second part of the question? How long will it take for it to decay to eight micrograms? In this case, we have our half-life. So mathematically speaking, our formula is going to be this. Our N, our final amount, is equal to N naught, my initial amount, multiplied by the E to the negative lambda T, where T is the time that we're particularly after. Now, our final amount is given. That's equal to eight. Our initial amount, well, we're gonna start right from the get-go, and that's going to be 80. And then we've got e to the negative. Now we know the value, that's 0 0.043 multiplied by t. Now we see that we have eight over 80, eight, eight over 80 is 0 0.1, is equal to e to the negative 0 0.043 multiplied by t. We need now to rearrange this. You need to use your logarithms here. If you have the natural log of 0 0.1, you get negative 0.043 multiplied by t. So and all you now need to do is put this into the calculator and it'll become a negative number. Divide this by that negative number and you'll get t is equal to 53.55 
hours. And the unit is based on your decay constant. And that's the answer. Let's do question 25. Now in this question, we're dealing with module five. And in this case, dealing with the third inquiry question, it's just all about gravitation. And what we have is a rocket that is launched vertically from a planet, some mass of M, and leaves the atmosphere and then the engines are turned off. That's an important point here. It continues the way to move away from the planet. And then obviously as it moves away from the planet, its speed changes. At point one, at this particular radius, we have a velocity of 5,500 meters per second. And at point two, it has a velocity of 2,900 meters per second. We're asked to show that the magnitude of the change in kinetic energy is from point one to point two is that value. Well, that's going to be relatively straightforward. The fact is, is that there's no forces acting on it anymore except the gravitational forces, but we're not really interested in We're just measuring kinetic energy and between point two and point one. So we say, basically, we have the change in kinetic energy is equal to the kinetic energy at two minus the kinetic energy at point one. Now, the kinetic energy is always a half mv squared minus a half mu squared. Now you'll see the half and the m are the same thing. The mass of the rocket is 200 kilograms, so we might as well just say that two times our 200 kilograms, and then all we have to do is our v squared and our u squared. 5,500 squared, we minus our 2,900 squared, you'll get 2.18 times 10 to the power of nine joules, which is approximately 2.2 times 10 to the power of nine joules, which is the answer that we're asked for. Now, the next part of the question says, well, determine the mass of the planet using the law of conservation of energy. Well, in essence, in order to do, to do this, you need to understand that any changes in the kinetic energy results of changes in its gravitational energy. In other words, basically, that's a concept of the law of conservation of energy, that somehow energy changes as it moves through the gravitational field, changing from one into the other. So if we have a decrease in kinetic energy by this particular value, then we must also have an increase of the gravitational energy. Now I'm gonna put my solution for this one up over here. A decrease in kinetic energy must result an increase in our gravitational energy. If we say, okay, what is my gravitational energy at point two and subtract our gravitational energy at point one, well, that value is going to be our value that we had before, which was 2.2 by 10 to the power of nine joules. So what is the mathematical formula for gravitational energy at any particular point? Well, it's going to be equal to negative G, big M, lowercase m, the mass of the planet, mass of the rocket, divided by the radius, and this is the radius at two, minus negative G, capital M, lowercase m, over the radius of one. Remember, this is all going to end up being that value, and I'll draw out on that in a moment. But what's common here? The common thing is the G, the M, and the lowercase m. So we can take those outside and we go negative 6.67 by 10 to the power of negative 11, there is our g. We have the mass of our planet, which is m, it's the thing we're looking for. We have our mass of our rocket, which is 200. And that, of course, is outside. And remember, this is just this boat. We know it's gonna be equal to that. Outside in one over r2, which is 2.5 by 10 to the power of seven, subtract one over 4.3 by 10 to the power of six. All of this equals that value. That means if I get M by itself, I will get our 2.2 by 10 to the power of nine, all divided by negative 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11, multiplied by 200, multiplied by negative 1.92 by 10 to the power of negative seven. That value there is that value right there. And now you'll see I have a negative over here and a negative over here. That's going to mean I have a positive value. And so my final answer ends up being 8.59 by 10 to the power of 23 kilograms. And that summarizes the answers for the short answer for the HSC. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Put a comment down below if this has been helpful for you. And please consider supporting my channel by buying me a coffee. The link is in the description below. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care and bye for now.